Good morning, Peak City Church. It's good to be worshiping with you on this beautiful Palm Sunday. We have a special treat. Our student ministry is leading us in worship, so can you go ahead and stand to your feet?
God, we thank you that those words are true, that you will never fail us, you will never forsake us, you will never leave us. Even when the rain comes, even when the wind blows, we can trust that you are our firm foundation, Lord. So God, we put our trust in you this morning, Lord. Amen. Well, now is the time in our service where we make a time for prayer ministry. Um, we are a praying church. We believe that God is moving, that he is healing, that he is changing lives. And so we want to encourage you, if you need prayer this morning, if you are praying for a breakthrough, if you're believing for something this morning, if you're praying for a breakthrough for someone that you love and you know, if you're believing for healing, we want to pray for you. We have a wonderful prayer team that wants to stand with you, that wants to minister to you. So I'd like to invite the prayer team to go ahead and come forward and encourage you to please take advantage of this ministry this morning. If you need prayer, we want to pray for you.
opportunity that we get to worship you together here as a church. Lord, I pray that hearts would be touched and that you would bless the rest of our time in this service. Lord, I pray that somebody would get saved today by your power. In the Lord's name, amen. 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 I don't know about you guys, but I was very blessed by our student ministries worship this morning, so very grateful for them. Now I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Nate. He's going to give us some announcements this morning. If you can go ahead and give him a warm welcome. Good morning, everyone. As you're being seated, uh, my name is Nate. I am one of the greeters at Peak City Church, and I'm your service host today. It's an honor to be here with you on Youth Sunday. Can we just give it up for these students one more time, serving the Lord, giving of their gifts and talents? Hey, keep it going. we got 20 other kids serving in other ministry areas all around the church right now. They're, they're teaching kids in kids' ministry, holding up signs, welcoming people as they come to church today. We thank God for the next generation. They're not the church of tomorrow. They're the church of today, and they are stepping into their role as servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise God for that. Hey, if you're a first-time guest here, we're so excited that you're here. Church family, let's give it up for any first-time guests in the house today. Welcome to Peak City. You came to the second of two worship celebrations today, and if you're kind of wondering what's going on with this church, we're a church that's founded on Jesus, on the cross, on the, the death and the resurrection of Christ. We live out the word of God. We don't add to or take away from it, and we just seek to live a life of faith that glorifies and honors the one who died to rescue us. Because Christ is risen, we have hope eternal in him. So, hey, if you're here for the first time or the tenth time, or this is your church family, and you're here every week. Uh, we have this connect card and it's here for you. This is a way for you to communicate with the church anything that you've got going on. If there's prayer needs and you want the prayer team, that's just a piece of the prayer team you saw this morning. We have folks that will be praying for those needs all week long. Write those down on your connect card. In a moment, we're actually going to receive our morning tithes and offerings. So we're going to move that to the front of the service today. But you can drop those connect cards in the offering basket when it goes by. And if you have prayer requests, our prayer team will be praying. If you have questions that you'd like answered, information we can give you about our church, mark that connect card up. And if you don't have a paper card, you can always scan the QR code, the quick response code there. Uh, if you can get on the school's Wi-Fi, it'll take you to the online connect card. And we'll get you that information this week as well. So anything you'd like to know, go ahead and just mark that connect card. We won't put you on a mailing list unless you ask us to. We have a weekly newsletter. It goes out every week, lets you know what's going on in the life of the church. If you'd like to be a part of that, simply mark your connect card and tell us to put you on that list. So we, we do connect cards, and then we also check in on Facebook every week. We do this because you know people in your social circles that we don't. And if you're checking in on Facebook and people in your social network see you're coming to this church that's preaching the gospel, that's preaching about Jesus, maybe they get interested and maybe they'll want to come as well. And maybe, just maybe, they'll hear the message of the gospel and Jesus will change their life forever just because you checked in on Facebook. Now, if that ain't good enough, and that is plenty good, we also use this as an excuse to be generous. So typically we do $2 donated towards some organization doing the most good for the Lord locally or around the world for every Facebook check-in. But this month is special. We're supporting Lovato Orphan Care, and this is a ministry in Romania that takes care of orphan children. There's many parents that actually just say, we don't want our babies, and they turn them over to a hospital. The hospital has so many babies in it, they don't have enough caregivers to be able to hold the children every day to the point where the kids, the babies don't even cry anymore because they know that there's no one to come to hold them. So they're fed and they're cared for as best they can there. This organization goes in and loves on these children, brings them supplies and gives them things like what we're going to contribute, diapers and wipes and that sort of thing. So every time you check in on Facebook, we're committing as a church to purchase one pack of diapers and one pack of wipes for a child over in Romania. So if you want to check in 10 times in the next 24 hours, that's us committing the dollars for 10 packs of diapers and 10 wipes just because you checked in on Facebook 10 times. I hope this is the biggest, most generous offering we give towards any organization that we've ever given to in the history of our church for Facebook check-ins. But it requires you to check in on Facebook, all right? So you say, well, Pastor, why don't you just write the check? I would say, brother, because I know a lady wouldn't say this to me, right? I'd say, brother, why don't you just check in on Facebook? How about that? Uh, so that's a great organization. Support that. Uh, Baptism Sunday is coming up. How many of you guys are excited about Baptism Sunday? People go in public in their faith. Man, we celebrate. 
what God is doing in the lives of people in our church. And if you have never made the decision for yourself to be baptized, if you've given your life to Jesus and you've never made the decision to be baptized, April 7th is your day. Let us know that you want to get baptized, all right? So uh, here's what we believe at Peak City. It's a decision that you make. We call this believer's baptism. As we read in the Bible, baptism is something that you choose to do because you are telling the world, you're going public in your faith, telling the world you've decided to follow Jesus. So maybe your parents had you baptized as a child and you're a follower of Jesus Christ today. Well, why don't you make April 7th the day that you go public in your faith because you chose to be baptized. We would love to celebrate that with you. Mark your Connect card, we'll get you more information. This is Holy Week, so Palm Sunday is the kickoff of Holy Week. And for us in particular, we're gonna be gathering uh, for three more worship celebrations during Holy Week. The next one after today is on Good Friday. So this Friday, right here at Apex High School at 6.30 p.m., we're gonna have a Good Friday service where we remember the death of Jesus Christ when he gave his life to pay for the sins of the world. We'll have age-appropriate worship for Peak City kids, pre-K and kindergarten through fifth grade. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll say, if you've got babies, you can keep them in here with you. We'll have the parents' room available as well if you need to step out and, and take care of your little one. Uh, but we won't have a nursery, so we'll have pre-K and K through five kids ministry. And the middle school and high schoolers, you're in here with us. It's heavy. It's, it's not it's not an easy message, so we make sure that we have church for kids. It's age appropriate. And the rest of us, we need to come and remember what Christ has done for us. Amen? So, hey, invite somebody. It's a great opportunity. A lot of churches don't get to have a Good Friday service. We do. Invite them to worship with us. And then we celebrate this other thing three days later. And it is the victory that was won for all of mankind because Jesus is risen. So we're going to celebrate on Easter the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Be an inviter. It is the easiest time to get someone to say yes to an invitation to come to church with you. Before you leave, we'll give you some invite cards and just make it really, really simple. People got kids. Guess what? We love kids. We'll have an Easter egg hunt after each worship celebration, so no one's going to miss something if they come to 915 or 11. Right out here in the courtyard, actually, an enclosed area. Can I get an amen? Right? And these kids are going to go hunting thousands of eggs. It's going to be a blast for them, but better than that is the fact that we will see so many folks cross from death to life in Jesus Christ. This is one big celebration. So, hey, go out and invite somebody. Let's help to populate heaven in Jesus' name for this coming Resurrection Sunday. Yeah? All right, last announcement. We got a great, great crew of folks that helped to get us set up and help to get all this equipment broken down every week. And that's called our logistics team, logistics team at, here at Peak City Church. And one of the, the parts of that team is our fleet team. Those are the folks that drive the trailer to the school, they pick it up from where we store it, drive it to the school, we unload the gear. At the end of the day, they'll take that trailer and they'll drive it back to the location full of gear and park it for us. Uh, and so I would just say this to you, if you've got experience towing and you'd like to serve the Lord and you just weren't sure about where or how to plug in, well, I wanna invite you to consider being a part of the logistics team. So you don't have to have a CDL uh, license to do this, but you do have to have experience towing. Uh, if you do have a CDL, the Lord knows who you are and the Holy Spirit's gonna convict your heart about serving him with gladness in Jesus' name. Your pastor has one as well, okay? I, I Listen, I drive with the fleet team every single week. Every time I'm here, every time you see me, I drove with fleet, okay? So I'm a part of this as well. Would love for you to be a part. If you're interested, if you could serve the Lord with us, we'd love to have you do that. Uh, mark your Connect card. Let us know that you can be a part. If we had, you know, five folks that could drive, man, that would mean about once a month. That's about the only time that, that folks have to rotate in to do that. But it's fun, and you get to be around some great people, and it's a huge blessing to the church. So if you have experience towing, let us know. We'd love to get you connected to be a part of our fleet team. Also, you don't have to have a truck. Peak City Church has a diesel truck that you can drive if you've got the experience towing. So there you go. And now that I've taken away all of your excuses and your wife is vigorously elbowing you in the side, as I see happening in the crowd right now, praise God. We're going to shift into a time of giving. Our ushers can go ahead and prepare to come uh, as they're coming on down front, getting ready to receive our morning tithes and offerings. I want to say a sincere thank you. Thank you to everybody that gives so faithfully. Uh, we see the fruit of what God is doing all around us all the time. And so it's with joy in our heart that we give. He gives us more than we need. And we always try to remember what the more is for. We faithfully return the tithe to the Lord that belongs to him. We give gifts and offerings. And we do that as the Lord leans on our heart to do so. And, and we, work, we give with joy because it's worship to God. Amen. Amen. So as you give today, we want to say a sincere thank you. And if you're a first-time guest... Don't feel any obligation to give in the offering today. 
okay? You being here, that's a gift to Peak City Church. It's a gift to us. And don't forget, we got a little gift to give you at guest services even before you leave. Just let them know over at the table that it was your first time here, and they'll give you a, a little gift there. Uh, so here's what I'll do. I'm going to pray over the offering, and then I'm going to share just a one little thought, and then we'll receive it. Father, I pray that you would bless the offering that we received today, the, the, the gifts that are being given, the tithe that's being returned. And I pray that you would do, you would have us do exactly what you want to with all of that. We thank you for these resources. We pray that they would all be used to build your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn your attention to the screens because I want you to check this video out that's going to show you why your student needs to be a part of Peak City Students. As the basket's Sorry. passing you by, check this out. All right, they're going to use one of the 16 minutes. You guys are cool. First. <laughs> My favorite thing about students is probably the games. Even though sometimes they get like super crazy, they're still super fun. My favorite thing about students is the board with the question on it, and it normally has a question that relates to the sermon, but it's most of the time it's pretty fun. My favorite thing about students is that. Um, the people here are very welcoming. My favorite thing about students is definitely the environment that we have and the friendships and just being able to talk about personal things and having friendships here. My favorite event that I've been to was skate night because I hung out with a bunch of my friends and we ate pizza. Do oh, winter extreme counts? Yeah. Can I say, can I say like two? I really like skate night. It was really fun and there were really good songs that we skated to that I really liked. Um, um, my favorite thing we did in students was probably like the fall kickoff we did in there for, because I really like beating everybody. <laughs> my favorite event at students is winter retreat. Um, it was a lot of fun. We s snowboarded and we learned about God. Um, my favorite thing about students is the small groups because I like talking with the teachers because they're really nice and I like talking with the other students too. It's really nice just to have like some like people that you can talk to. My favorite thing about small groups is doing the prayer requests because we can all kind of share what we're going through and what we need help with and support each other. Uh, what I like about small groups is that I get to see other people's point of view. Um, I think I would want somebody to come to students because um, it's honestly, it's not that hard to invite someone because um, we do a lot of fun things that even kids who like don't know Jesus, they would like want to do it too. And that might eventually lead to like them getting to know Jesus. And um, I mean, I've seen it happen. It was probably one of like the best experiences that I've had. It's a really good place where you can relate to other people and get support and even if you don't believe in God, we're all in middle school and high school and going through some of the same things. So we can help each other out. It's really fun and it's a good way to connect with people your age. Um, I think other people should come to youth group because I think it's a great experience to learn about God. So um, you should definitely come to youth group. You should come to students because it's a way to follow God and meet a lot of new people. Yeah, we, we, we was <laughs> laughing. Was <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Austin. I am the Next Generation Pastor. I'm over our students and our kids here at the church. Can we give another hand for our students serving today? 
I said it in the first service, but I'm so proud of y'all. Man, I, it, is, it is a joy and an honor to be their student pastor. It's an honor to be the kids' pastor, to see these students working in the kids' ministry, the frontline team. There's one backstage that you don't even see right now. In the band, they serve um, on our outreaches. Man, they, they have such beautiful hearts. I, I was not at that place when I was a student. I was just a... Uh, uh, a smart aleck who thought he knew the Bible really well, and uh, I don't think, <laughs> and I don't think that I had that sort of heart for serving the way they do, and it's so amazing to see them grow in their faith, to love the Lord with all their heart, their soul, and their, their mind, and it is, it is truly an honor, so thank you for serving any of the students that can hear me right now. Um, it's such a wonderful Sunday. Uh, we're going to pray before we get in the message, and then um, we're going to listen to Mark and what he has to say about Palm Sunday. If you could bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for the beginning of this holy week where we remember that you came to Jerusalem, you died, and you rose again. Lord, as we face down Easter and Good Friday, as we celebrate Palm Sunday, we remember you, we want to remember you for who you were, not who we want you to be, not who um, so many other people claim you are, but, but you're not, Lord. We, we want to know the real you. We want to get to know Jesus, the real Christ, and we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would put in our hearts a word that you have to tell us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, why don't we stand as we read the Bible today? We're going to be reading from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. And this is the story of Palm Sunday. The words will be on the side screens if you do not have your Bible. This is the word of the Lord. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away, and they found a cold colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Starting out, I just want to get on with the first point here today. And, and that is, from this story... I think we can see that Jesus messes with our expectations. Jesus messes with our expectations. The very first verse of the Gospel of Mark, it says, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, Christ isn't Jesus' last name. Christ is his title. He is the Messiah. He is the appointed one, the chosen one the Savior. And Mark is telling us straight out who Jesus is in the very first verse, and it's for a reason. So that when we read what Jesus actually said, what he sounded like, what he did, the way he acted, the way he did, did his ministry, we might be taken a little off guard, because who we expect Jesus to be is not who he actually was. For example, there's something in the Gospel of Mark called the Messianic Secret. 
This is the secret that he is the Messiah. The very first chapter of the Bible, he exercises a demon from somebody. And before the demon comes out, he says, I know who you are. You are the Christ, the son of David. And Jesus says, shut up. (laughs) Don't say anything anymore. Get out of this person. Now, you know, not letting demons talking is probably a good idea. But for people who would recognize this might be the one that we've been looking for. This might be the Messiah, the chosen one who's been prophesied for hundreds of years. He said, don't tell anyone who I am. Just tell them that God is good. He's been so good to you. Tell them what God has done for you when you go back to your village. And of course, the people went back and told them, how amazing Jesus was, who he is, who he might just be the Messiah. And the crowds got so intense in Jesus's ministry that he could not stay in a city. He, Mark says that he could not even enter certain cities because the crowds would just gather and pack around. And so he had to do his ministry very soon in the countryside and in the fields and in the wilderness. And he had to preach outside of where the populations were. That's why the Sermon on the Mount There are so many crowds gathered by the mountain and not in the city. He has to flee the crowds just to get some personal time and some uh, uh, some space to pray. He, He goes across the Sea of Galilee after he preaches, after he heals, just so he can reach more people because his mission was not quite what everyone else expected it would be. They saw him as healer. They saw him as prophet. They saw him as the savior who would rescue them from a certain someone. But he came to preach the good news of a kingdom that was upside down, that was nothing of what they ever expected, that was built on love and grace, that was about forgiving your enemies. And he went to preach, and that was his mission. And that is true for us today that what we know about Christ, what we expect of the Messiah, sometimes interferes with the mission that he has for us to accomplish. Just as the crowds had their expectations and it interfered with his preaching ministry, we and our expectations sometimes interfere with his mission. Who we imagine Jesus to be does not always line up with who he is and what he actually came to do. We really like nice Jesus, don't we? I mean, I'm the kids pastor. I know that he welcomed the little children. He, he loved to be with them. He loved to welcome them and show them that there, show everyone that there's dignity in little kids. That's how a lot of us see him. He is meek. He is mild. He is a good teacher and a good man. But there is so much more to him. There is so much more of a reason why he came. In your Bibles, under this section, Mark 11, the, the title, it might say something like the triumphal entry. Some of us know Palm Sunday as the triumphal entry. And what that means is that in those days, the Romans and the Jews before them, when they had a revolt about 100 years earlier, they would conquer their enemies. They would ride gloriously into the capital or into the main city. They would have, uh, you know, the royal treatment, the red carpet, and then they would come to the temple and they would offer sacrifices to God or to the gods. And there would be this huge celebration because the general has conquered, has vanquished the enemies. We will see that the crowds expected this of Jesus. They expected him to enter as a conquering Messiah in victory over their enemies. And who was their enemy in Jerusalem? It was Rome. Rome was overseeing that province. They were brutal. They were harsh. So many empires before had destroyed the city, destroyed their temple, They're still under the reign of tyrannical rulers, of puppet masters, of emperors that say, I am God. And they want to be rescued. I hope that we get that today. They they were waiting for a Messiah, much like 
we think of a Messiah should be. There's a movie right now in theaters called Dune. Has anyone else, has anyone seen Dune or read the books? Yeah, it's, it's pretty great. Um, Dune is all about the story of a royal son who frees an oppressed people and deposes an emperor. If you don't like, if you don't know about Dune, I'm sure y'all are familiar with Star Wars. Star Wars is all about the son of the most powerful force wielder in the galaxy who freed an oppressed people and deposed an emperor. And if you don't like Star Wars, maybe Lord of the Rings, right? It's the story of a royal son who freed an oppressed people and deposed a dark lord. There is such a narrative of how we like our so stories, how we love our heroes. We want a savior to be in a certain way. We want them to vanquish our enemies. We have expectations for our Messiah. But Mark fleshes out who the Messiah really is, and it's that Jesus came to suffer and die. And that is not so I don't know, cheerworthy on first thought. Jesus came to be the suffering servant as prophesied in Isaiah 53, which is so different from what we want and expect. What's so fun about Dune, what's so fun about Star Wars and Lord of the Rings and all these stories is that we can imagine ourselves as the main character. We can imagine that we have so much more about us, inside of us, than we ever thought possible. We come from so much more. There's so much within us and potential. We have, um, we can overcome obstacles. There's the secret to life that we have found that now we can trample our enemies. We can win the battle. Boys play like this. Men, Sometimes we still think of ourselves like this. We think of ourselves like this by providing for our families, by saving people from certain situations, by winning, you know, in sports, in business, in work, at home. And Jesus challenges our main character narrative. He challenges our hero complex. He challenges our authority to rule and to win on our own terms. He challenges us and says, you are not in control. Jesus challenges our authority. He challenges his disciples. He challenges the crowds. He challenges the religious leaders. He challenges the reader at Jerusalem to help us see all of the symbols, the imagery, the prophecy, the expectation that the people had. I want to paint the picture of what Palm Sunday looked like to everybody else. I want to give us context because context is key to understanding. And I want us to understand how big a deal Palm Sunday is. Are y'all tracking with me? Say, uh-huh. Uh -huh. All right, all right. Verse 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, I have to ask, what? Who is they, right? Is it Jesus and his little band of ragtag disciples? Is that it? Are they just showing up all meek and mild? He gets the donkey, he goes down, and people are like, who's this? It's not the picture of Palm Sunday. Mark writes before chapter 11 that a large crowd follows him all the way from Jericho to Jerusalem. His disciples, they are fishermen, they are tax collectors, they are young. They might look more like a youth group than the men with old beards that sit around and, you know, talk about theology all day. They, the crowd is people who have been healed of their sicknesses. It is people who have been freed of demon possession. It is men and women. It is formerly blind Bartimaeus who is healed in Jericho, and it is people who have heard that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. A man who is risen from the dead, don't you think that you would come out and see him and hear his story? And so there is this huge crowd that is following Jesus, and they are expecting something big. Mark writes that they are fearful and amazed. Why? Luke writes that they thought the kingdom of God was coming immediately, right then. As Jesus enters Jerusalem, they thought, now's the time. 
It's a large crowd of everyday people expecting something big to happen who follows Jesus. They go into Jerusalem, the capital city of Judea, the holy city. It's swelling with Jews from all over the world who have come to Passover. Passover is like their major holiday, one of their major holidays. And this is where they gather together from all around the world to celebrate the fact that God so many years ago freed them from uh, slavery in Egypt. It is in remembrance and celebration of that. And there are political overtones here in Passover. The Romans are probably a little nervous. Pontius Pilate comes into Jerusalem for this festival. They might have put extra guards around the city because they know that this festival that celebrates freedom from captivity and oppression mirrors their expectations and their hopes of freedom from tyranny and oppression from Rome. And so lots of people are gathered for this festival and they're wondering if something big will happen this year. They go also to the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is right outside of Jerusalem. It's a beautiful overlook to all of the city. You can see from wall to wall. And it's prophesied in the book of Zechariah that God will come gather his enemies around Jerusalem and he will do battle with them and he will stand on the Mount of Olives when he does this. So anyone who's in the know about who Jesus is and might be as their Messiah might have been pretty ecstatic when they see him coming down from the Mount of Olives. All these prophecies, all of these images are coming together. They're coalescing. And Jesus is possibly the one who's going to save them. Now, why does he ride a donkey? He comes, uh, Jesus says, go into the village in front of you and immediately you'll find a colt tied. A colt is a young donkey, a young horse. In this case, it is a young donkey. And Jesus rides this, not just because he's meek and mild and he's humble and he wants to appear more lowly than he actually is. This is to fulfill the prophecy that the Messiah is coming, riding on a donkey to bring peace to his people. Also, King Solomon, son of David, when he was crowned king, he sat on his father's mule as he was inaugurated as king going into Jerusalem. There's all this imagery of peace for Israel when Jesus rides this donkey. He's not coming on a war horse declaring war. He is coming in peace. But the question for the Jews as he's coming is, how is he making peace? Is he making peace? Is he going to announce a war? Is he going to free us by the sword so he can bring peace to his people? we can start to see how the crowd's expectations differed from Jesus's mission. And it's so funny how we can see Jesus and we can misinterpret him so wildly different from what he came to do, from who he is. I want us to be humble today as we read this story and consider the fact that Jesus is a little different that he might mess with our expectations. He might challenge our authority. He had an authority like Nate preached about weeks ago where Jesus calmed the storm. It's the same authority, the Lord of heaven and earth who calms an unbroken donkey. You've got to break a horse in. You've got to break a donkey in if, they're going, if you're going to ride it, right? And if we know anything about donkeys, right? They're stubborn. And this lordship, this authority that Jesus has, it ties into something that he says to his disciples. He says, if anyone asks you, why are you untying this colt? Say to them that the Lord himself has need of it. I won't go into all the details of how we know that he's describing the Lord in a special way 
I'll save you the time, but all this time in Mark, he's been keeping his identity a secret. He's been telling people not to tell others that he is the Messiah. And here, as he's entering Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, fulfilling prophecy, he is making very clear to people who he is. He tells his disciples to tell the owners of the cult that God himself needs this donkey, which sounds kind of funny, honestly. It's a little weird <laughs> that God needs to ride a donkey. The way this is constructed in the Greek is very important. Lord appears many times in the New Testament. It can mean sir, it can mean master. But the way this is constructed, the way Jesus says this to his disciples means God has need of this donkey. Later, he will say it loud and clear in his trial to the Pharisees. When he's before the judges, before the Sanhedrin, and they ask him, are you the Christ? Come out with it. He says, I am. Which is to say, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, the God of Israel. I am the voice from the burning bush that spoke to Moses to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. I am the I am who I am. I am God himself, and it is God who is riding to Jerusalem on a donkey coming in peace. This is not just a good teacher, a prophet, or a coming king. This is not just anybody. This is not just the chosen man. This is God in flesh. He did not come to condemn the world. Thank God he came to save it. And as they spread their cloaks on the road, this is a sign of divinity. This is a welcoming a king. In the Old Testament, there was a king of Israel, King Jehu, who as he was inaugurated, they threw their cloaks on the steps to welcome him, to coronate him. So they are, through so many symbols, through so many actions, they are crowning the king. They are welcoming him into the city. The same with the palm branches. They're cutting down leafy branches, Mark says, that John clarifies are palm branches. They're throwing them down. They're giving him the green carpet treatment, if you will, into the city. And there are so many people that are coming out from Jerusalem. He has a large crowd following him. He has a large crowd coming to him. So many people that the religious leaders say, look, the whole world has gone after him. Matthew says that the city was stirred because of Jesus, and they're all hailing him as king, and they shout, Hosanna, which means save us. It is a word from Psalm 118 that Jews would come and sing as they enter to Jerusalem, and this is a thanksgiving psalm. They sing, Hosanna, save us. They sing, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and they see in Jesus the fulfillment of prophecy, of their songs, of their very words, their traditions, and they are saying with all their hearts, save us. We need liberation. And in this context, it would be from Rome. And so they add to this psalm as they're singing. They add a line. They say, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. There will be, in their minds, a different political reality than Rome over them. He entered Jerusalem. He goes into the temple, and everyone is so excited. They're following Jesus. They're going into the temple. He is standing there. They're wondering, is he about to make a sacrifice? Is he going to complete this kind of triumphal procession that he's leading? Is he going to announce his holy war against Rome so we can finally beat them back. And Mark takes the time to tell us that Jesus looked everywhere. And I want to shift focus because when I read that and I see how little detail sometimes goes into the gospel of Mark, goes into the Bible on certain subjects where we want more detail, we want more paint in the, on the canvas. And he tells us that Jesus looked around. I have to ask, what did Jesus see? We knew what the crowds expected. We knew what we want from a Messiah. What did Jesus see? He saw the walls of Jerusalem that would be destroyed in 40 years by the Romans. They would sack the city and massacre the people. He wept over that as he entered the city. He would see the temple as he's in the courts 
that was built by Herod, the king who tried to kill him when Jesus was a baby. He saw all the people in front of him, the, those that are gathered and that are expecting to crown him king and savior. But he also sees one other thing. Because it was the week of Passover, because Jerusalem was packed, on Friday, they would sacrifice a lamb. But on Sunday, according to tradition, they would purchase the lamb. And so he heard across the city thousands of lambs being bought and brought back to people's houses so that they could make the sacrifice, so that they could remember the Passover five days later. Lambs were costly. I think, in our mind's eye, I think we can possibly agree that to see thousands of lambs being led to the slaughter might be deeply moving. It would direct the Jewish people to think about what God has done for them, and this is what God has done. I've alluded to it, but on Passover, God chose Israel to be a people. They did not deserve it. They did nothing to earn it, but he chose them to be his people, a people whom he loved, a people that would be a light to the Gentiles, to everyone who's non-Jewish. They would be a holy nation. They would be a royal priesthood. They would be a people for God's own possession. They would be those who would proclaim the excellencies of God, who has called them from darkness into marvelous light, from Egypt and slavery into freedom, into a promised land. God called them not by their merit, and it is worth celebrating. The night of Passover, God sent one final plague upon Egypt. He had sent nine frogs, gnats, boils, hail, nasty things. But Egypt, Pharaoh, would not let God's people go. And so, the final plague that God sent was the death of the firstborn throughout all of Egypt. Israel was no more deserving to be spared God's wrath than Egypt was, but he gave them an alternative to their firstborn because he loved them. He gave them the command to take a male lamb, one year old, to slaughter it, to dip a hyssop branch into the blood, and to paint the blood upon the doorposts of their homes. So that when the Lord came and passed over Egypt and took the firstborn sons of their enslavers, he would pass over them. He would not touch their households. He would spare them in his mercy and in his grace because he saw the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. This is what they're celebrating, that they were spared the wrath of God and they've entered into his grace. Thousands of years later, Jesus would hear the bleating of the lambs and the noise of the crowds. He would take in the sheer number of all these people who've come all across the world to celebrate the Passover. He knows their hearts. He knows their hopes. He knows their fears. Of course, he knows their expectations. He knows how they see him. He knows who would be saved. He knows who would perish. And at the Temple Mount, he looks around. And everyone expects something to happen. It's all led to this moment. And he departs to Bethany, a village just outside Jerusalem. The crowds whittle away. And it's just the 12 with him. This is so disappointing. <laughs> there was supposed to be a climax. There was supposed to be something exciting. There was supposed to be an announcement. There was supposed to be a new reign and a new rule. There was supposed to be something that broke the oppression of the Romans. What happens is more similar, and stay with me for a second, to the end of Monty Python and the quest for the Holy Grail. If you all have seen that movie... Man, it's funny. And it's joke after joke after joke after joke. And as a little kid, man, it was funny and all, but like at the end of the day, you want King Arthur to go assault that French castle who's been making fun of them the whole movie. 
And at the end of the movie, in the last three minutes before the credits cut to black, before the screen cuts to black, he has his whole army arrayed in all their regalia, helmets, shields, swords. There's drums in the soundtrack. The camera's moving everywhere. He calls his men to battle and they charge and it's like shaky cam and it's, you're, you're in it. You're in their charge. And what happens when King Arthur's knights get to the French castle? Police show up all of a sudden and all of a sudden these 20th century Br British 70s style police officers show up in two vans. It's two officers and they take King Arthur away they lock him up and everyone's left standing like, what do we do now? And it cuts to black. <laughs> Apparently, they ran out of money and so they couldn't film the final battle. So what did they do? They have King Arthur arrested and they introduce this whole plot about some knight killing a historian and it's just, it's crazy. It, it's a final joke on the audience. And as a kid, I was so disappointed and I was so frustrated. If you have, if you have a chance, just watch that clip and man, it's crazy how fast it ends. And I think that as funny as that is, I think there's a little bit of humor that Mark is also pointing out here that we have all these expectations about what Jesus will do. He had so much weight of, of people wanted him to be this specific thing. And so why does he not have a final showdown? Why is he so anticlimactic? Why is, dare I say, Jesus disappointing on Palm Sunday? And it's because Jesus refused to be Israel's political messiah. He still refuses to be our political Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah on his terms only. So if we want a different one, we'll have to worship a false one. False Messiahs cannot save us. That is the catch. So Jesus challenges our authority at Jerusalem in the temple courts on Palm Sunday, and he reminds us that he is God and we are not. He has ordered the universe for this moment, and he did not come to conquer, initiate another war, and win by the blood of his enemies. He came to give his own life and shed his own blood to save the world. Jesus is the Passover lamb of God. He is God's son given by his father to take away all of the sins of the world. Now there was the imaginary political Messiah of the crowds, but then there was Jesus, the true Messiah who came in peace and his kingdom is not of this world. He came not to be served, but to serve us. How crazy is that, that the Lord of heaven and earth, the creator of the entire universe came in flesh to wash our feet, to love us unto death to seek and save the lost, to give his life as a ransom for sinners from the fires of hell. The Lamb of God was slain for our sins. It was his life instead of ours. To quote the late great pastor Timothy Keller, Jesus did not come into the world so you would like him. We might have to wrestle with that because a lot of us like Jesus, but then we read the gospel and he's a little weird <laughs> and he's not what we expected. Jesus did not come so you would like him. He arrives as your king. He is king and we are not. And him being king and him instituting a kingdom that is upside down, that prizes love over all else, that prizes the love of God, the love of neighbor, the love of enemies, the forgiveness of sins, rejecting your will and seeking the Father's will. The kingdom that serves instead of seeks to be served, this kingdom he brought and he commands obedience and he commands respect, but he also commands love. 
He came as the Messiah, not just any Messiah, and he will not be ignored. So my question to you today is, will you crown him or will you kill him? That is the content of Holy Week. This is the choice and there is no third option. Now we might think there is a third option. I could ignore him <laughs> and that might just be good enough for me. But really there are only two scenarios. It's either you surrender your life to the King of Kings, to the risen Lord of heaven and earth, to live for him, to crown him as King, or you crucify the Lord Jesus in your heart and you keep playing the king or the queen of your own life on your own little throne for your own world. There is no alternative. You either serve him or you don't. The Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, he killed Jesus. The Pharisees, they killed Jesus. The Sanhedrin, the judges that he faced in trial, they killed Jesus. And as you might have heard before, maybe not, the crowds who shouted Hosanna, who hailed him as king on Sunday, they shouted, some of them did, crucify him on Friday. And we think of ourselves as good people, but Jesus even challenges that idea. Some of the same ones who hailed him as king shouted crucify him. And so what other proof do we need of our sinful nature? If you have to be convinced, look at the cross because the son of God came in flesh to save us and we nailed him to a tree. But the good news of the gospel, the whole reason it was written, the whole reason we're here today gathered together, the whole reason I'm speaking to you and I have joy in my heart is that there is no other proof we need of the infinite love of God. We can look to the cross because Jesus came to save us and he died in our place. Philippians says this, a letter that Paul wrote to this church in Philippi. He writes this beautiful hymn that says, Jesus did not consider equality with God something to hold on to, but he emptied himself and he became a servant and he was born in our likeness and being found as one of us he humbled himself in obedience to God, his father. And he humbled himself in obedience unto death, even death on that horrible cross. The good news is that therefore, God has highly exalted him. He has given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ is Lord. Some of us here are saved and it's high time that we resurrender our lives to our King. We've been living our own way, but it's time to come back to Jesus. You're never too good to repent and give God all the glory. He reigns on high. Revelation says, John, John, he was given a vision of heaven. And when he's looking at the throne, another expectation is that Jesus would reign in glory and in power and the image would be of a conquering king, but instead he sees a lamb as though it had been slain. And he is the one to whom all honor and glory and power and praise and authority and wealth and all dominion is. It is to the slain lamb, the risen Lord. Some of us here might identify with the people in those crowds on Palm Sunday. You had expectations of Jesus. Maybe they were nice, but he is the crucified and risen Lord of heaven and earth. This isn't just a story, this is history. He is real and he loves you. Every single person here today, 
if you've heard nothing else, know that God so loved you, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but you will have eternal life. He did not come to condemn the world, but he came to save it. And so as we close today, I have one invitation that I wanna make. And it's so simple. Jesus does not say you have to get cleaned up to come to him, to give your life to the Lord. You can be wearing jeans, some horribly dirty converse, have no hair and look like a fool. He says, come as you are. He invites every single one of us who have not crowned him as Lord and Savior to do so today. And the simple and the beautiful thing is that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. There's no sentence between those two phrases. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so if we can bow our heads and close our eyes today, I want to make the simple invitation. We will not embarrass you. We will not call your name. We will not bring you down to the front. But if you would like to crown him as your Lord and Savior, if you would like to make a decision to follow Jesus and give him your life, if you would just raise your hand, I would love to pray for you. I would love to pray with you. I would love to lead us in a prayer of salvation. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If that's you today, would you raise your hand? Online, as you're watching, if you would like to give your life to the Lord today, you can text a number that's written on the screen, 919-289-9278, and we will follow up with you. We will celebrate you. I would like to lead us in a prayer today. So could we say out loud or in our hearts together, And just repeat after me, dear Jesus, thank you so much. I believe that you are Lord. I believe you are my King. And today I give my life to you. I crown you. I thank you. I give you praise. I was dead in my sin but you have given me new life. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray, amen. Y'all, can we celebrate anyone who just gave their life to the Lord? It is the best decision you will ever make. As we stand together, as we worship the Lord with thanksgiving and praise, would you crown him today? Would you crown him in this holy week? Would you crown him in your life? Would you give him the honor he deserves? He is over all of us. He is Lord of heaven and earth, and he loves you. He loves you. Would you stand and worship with us today?
was so good to worship with you on this Palm Sunday. Don't forget, we have service on Good Friday right here, 6.30. It's not going to be live stream, so you got to be in person. And then we have our Easter Sunday services at 9, 15, 11 a.m. Make sure to grab one of those invite cards. Invite someone at your work, at your school, your neighbor, anybody. We just want to have as many people here as possible to hear the good news that morning. So we love you guys. We'll see you on Friday.